want to welcome everyone to advanced training. My name is Lynn Wild. I'm a K-State Extension Research and Extension Wyandotte County Master Extension Master Gardener and serve as Vice President and Program Chair. Our program today is the No So Garden, and uh, the, this presentation will showcase self-sowing flowers and describe the necessary horticulture research techniques to achieve a glorious no-sow garden year after year. It's my pleasure to introduce Lenora Larson. She is the Miami County Extension Master Gardener and member of local chapters of both the Adelia Butterfly Society and Kansas Native Plant Society. She is a proud science geek with a degree in microbiology from Michigan State University, a career in molecular biology and a lifelong interest in wildlife, especially the creepy and crawly. She maintains a two acre garden in the English estate landscape style on her 27 acre long lips farm in rural Paola, Kansas. Take it away, Lenora. About every 15 slides, we're going to stop for questions. So Lynn is monitoring the chat room and so we'll have a chance to ask questions. But here we go. And again, we're Zoom so I can't ask for a show of hands. But I know that many of you have seen my gardens and they are full, pardon? I'm sorry. They are full of color. Uh, and for most of us who do ornamental gardening, landscape gardening, color really is our thing. That is what we are after. And so for a lot of people, it's a problem because the way you get the most color for the longest period of time is with annuals. Oh no, nobody has time to plant this many plants all over a garden. And so added to that is the fact I absolutely hate to plant. I like everything else about gardening, but I hate to plant. But through about 40 years now on Long Lips Farm, I have been identifying flowers, annual flowers, who are willing to take the responsibility for their own procreation. And every year with my doing very little intervention, they come back year after year. So this particular garden, I started in 2014. The first year you do have to plant, but thereafter it comes back. This particular photograph was taken in 2019. I'll take another one this spring just so I'm updated. I did not have to do the work to make this happen. So obviously we have a lot to talk about. Um, first of all, some definitions. Perennial and annual is not as clear cut. The horticulturalists have tried to confuse us and it does matter. And then I'm going to show you photographs of some of my favorite self-sowing annual flowers. And what I've discovered is because I have tours of my garden all summer long, year after year after year, most of these flowers are not familiar because nurseries don't sell them. They don't want to sell you a plant that will from then on never require you to again buy something from them. These plants will self-sow for you. So they're hard to find. And at the end, I am going to show you some resources of where you can find these plants. And then the horticultural aspects, how to get started and then how to maintain a self-sowing garden. And then finally, those seed sources and a summary. So first of all, perennial, well, that's easy. Um, perennials are defined as a plant that lives more than two years. If it only lives two years, it's a biennial. If it's more than two years coming back from the roots, it is a perennial. And we divide perennials into two kinds, the herbaceous, and I say, well, you know, green stems, or the woody, the trees and the shrubs. And so what we call shrubs in our gardens really are woody perennials, but perennials some of them are like almost immortal, like there are trees that have lived 1500 years. And the lifestyle of a perennial is, you know, starting from seed, and then they make foliage, and then they make flowers, and then they make more seeds. And then here in our climate, they take a rest because of winter. In the tropics, they may not even take a little rest, 
but it's an ongoing cycle year after year. And most of these plants here in our climate, the perennials only bloom once a year. A few of them bloom, you know, like in the early spring and then again in fall, but that's not the usual pattern. So you get this one glorious blaze of color from like your echinacea or your crepe myrtles, but then they're done and it's just leaves. On the other hand, annuals, annuals, botanically speaking, are plants that complete their entire life cycle in one year. They're genetically programmed, seed, foliage, flowers, seeds, and they die. And you can prolong the blooming by deadheading, but those plants are going to die. And so most of us know there's no point in digging up a zinnia and taking it into the greenhouse for the winter because it's going to die no matter how nice you are and how warm you keep it. And so it, there are many examples in our gardens and there are many hybrids of these plants, but to be the most satisfying for self-seeding, you're going to want to be using the species. Now where it's been confused, well, and here's Nigella just to show you an example, and, and for some of these the seed pod is just as beautiful as, in my mind at least, as the flower. And so there is an immortality in annuals, but it's through the seeds. And so for an annual, a true annual, um, they are putting all their energy into making as many flowers and therefore as many seeds as possible. That's their winter strategy. For the perennials, of course, they are putting most of the food they make through photosynthesis and most of their resources down in the roots. That's their strategy to get through a winter. But what's confused the picture of what's an annual and what's a perennial, many of the common garden plants are actually perennials, but they're from the tropics, so they're killed by our winters, not by their genes, but yet horticulturists refer to them often as annuals. But these are plants that you could dig up and bring into a greenhouse and they would live through the winter just fine. So here, just real quick, some examples. If any of you haven't discovered the Penicetum vertigo, it's Penicetum purpureum vertigo is the cultivar or variety. It is a tropical perennial. Uh, and so I have to plant it every year as much as I hate planting, but it's worth it. Likewise, the Hibiscus mahogany splendor. Um, our growing season, our summers are not long enough or hot enough for it even to make flowers. And so it exists as an annual foliage plant here in our climate. And then of course, lantana. So the problem with these tropical uh, annuals, if you're looking for a self-sowing garden, for many of them, our growing season isn't long enough or hot enough for them to set seeds. And even if they do set seeds, those seeds are not going to survive our winter. Now, another group of annual flowers that aren't going to work for a no-sow gardening, of course, are the hybrids. You know, hybrids are uh, a mating of two different species. They're not the same, they're not different varieties of the same species. They are two different species that have come together. It does happen naturally, for instance, with columbines who are notoriously promiscuous, but also many breeders have created wonderful hybrids. And so even though we are talking about self-sowing annuals, like for instance, these are the dreamland zinnias. And if we were in person, I would ask for a show of hands how many of you have discovered them. They are an annual. Uh, they do have nectar, even though they are sterile, they never make seeds, but you know, you want, you want some of these other plants in your garden, not just the no-sow. So for no-sowing, what we're looking for, they must reproduce by seed. Another way of saying that is that they're open pollinated and the seeds that they make must survive our winters. And when we say cross-pollination, of course, we're talking about um, mediated movement of the male pollen over to the female stigma to get the cross-pollination. Now, there are a lot of plants that do this by wind, you know, um, but if you are wind pollinated, you don't need to be beautiful to attract a pollinator. And so like our grasses and most of our trees, they are wind pollinated and so they don't have beautiful flowers. So when you see a beautiful flower, you know that it's either open pollinated and somebody, usually an insect, 
is doing the love connection or it's a hybrid created by man and man takes responsibility for that procreation. Um, so if you have a no-sow garden, you are also going to have a garden full of insects. And to me, of course, this is a wonderful thing. Um, and when we say pollinator, that's really a code word for bees. They are the chief pollinator. And yes, we have honeybees who are very sweet and I like them, but we also have 450 species of native bees who are far more efficient pollinators here in Eastern Kansas. One of our native bees is the bumblebee. And to me, these are absolutely adorable. Eight, you know, they've got six legs and wings and antennae. And to me, they look like yellow and black teddy bears. They are just so darling. Um, so another way of asking when you're looking for no so annuals is to ask for heirloom flowers. The flowers that your grandmother or great grandmother grew in her garden and passed the seeds along. So always the propagation was by seed. And these flowers aren't the original species because granny was smart and she always picked the most beautiful, the most floriferous, the most cold hardy of her plants to save the seeds from. And so they've been gradually improved from the original species. So why self-sowing annuals? Well, here's obviously the beauty of them. Uh, this is a garden planted in 2008. I took this photo in 2016. I should take another one in 2021 just to update it, but it will look pretty similar. And for those of you who aren't familiar with these flowers, you're gonna see them over and over in my slides. The ones at the forefront, those are the Mexican zinnia, zinnia angustifolia. There's also an orange profusion in front. That magnificent magenta flower, that is balsam. Balsam is one of the mainstays of my brilliant garden. And so you have to plant them the first year and then you let them die and let their little bodies just fall to the dirt where they were growing and become mulch. And the next year, they come back from the seeds that were planted as they died. So the other advantage of these annuals is the long growing season. So here are marigolds still in bloom in November. And I still have pollinators in my garden in November. Plus, you know, I, I'm really into eye candy. I want this color, I need this color. And so annuals do that for me. Uh, here's an example just for your education, but I think they're cute. Um, a lot of the little so-called bees that you see are actually flies. Um, my friends, the birds tell me that flies are absolutely delicious. And so these flies, the cirphid flies, they're also called hoverflies, have evolved to look and act like bees. And you'll see them, many times you'll see far more of these cirphid flies than you'll see bees in your garden. They're very efficient. They are to be loved, even though they are a fly. And you can tell them from bees. First of all, bees always have antennae, very nice, attractive antennae. And bees have four wings and flies always have only two wings, only one pair of wings. Another example of the value of self-seeding plants is how flexible they are, how they're usable in a lot of different applications. I use them a lot in my bedding plants, as bedding plants to have carpets of flower, carpets of color in my garden. But believe it or not, I also have a lot of my containers that are self-sown. Uh, I get so busy in spring, I don't get to all of my containers and then I turn around and look and they've already planted themselves. This is a good thing. Uh, for those of you who are fans of native plants, there are a lot of wonderful annual self-sowing native plants. And, you know, when people tour my garden, I always point out the native plants. And of course, a lot of them are perennials. I once had a gentleman comment, well, isn't it interesting that all native plants are perennials? Uh, no, that is not the case. What is the case is that all native plants sold by nurseries are perennials because it doesn't make economic sense for them to grow and sell annuals, and it doesn't make labor sense for you to plant all of those annuals. But they're certainly out there growing. You know, my land, and probably for most of you, used to be a tall grass prairie. Many of those seeds are already there. And so if you encourage the native plants, you will get these wild self-sowing annuals with beautiful, beautiful flowers, because just like our ornamental flowers, they need to attract pollinators. 
So I've been babbling on for you. Uh, Lynn, do we have any questions in the chat room? I do see a question. Okay. How do you encourage self-sowing wildflowers from the field? Um, the main thing is because I'm an amateur botanist, I recommend the little seedling when it comes up and I don't weed it out. And so when I see a new plant that I don't recognize in my garden, if it's cute, um, I leave it just to see what it will turn into. And I don't, you know, a lot of people, anything that they didn't buy in a plastic pot and plant themselves, they call it a weed. Um, I am much more flexible in my viewing of what is a weed. Uh, and so let unfamiliar plants grow to see uh, if you happen to know what that plant looks like as a seedling out in the wild, all the better. And then, of course, in whenever that plant blooms and goes to seed, you can gather those seeds with permission if it's not your property and scatter those seeds in your garden. And we are going to spend some time talking about how to get started with the seeds in spring. Did that? Probably more than you wanted to know. <laughs> Anything there, else, Lynn? Yes. On the slide with the Mexican petunias, what were the other plants? Uh, there was an orange perfusion um, at the same level at the front of the bed, and that was a self-sown orange perfusion zinnia. And then behind that was magenta balsam. And we have one more question. Can I pick the seed pods from the wild growing flowers in the field and plant the seed in my beds close to the house? Um, yes, but you don't need to plant the seed. And we're gonna get into the horticultural section of uh, what you would do in practice is what mother nature does, which is just drop the seed pod and let it disperse itself on top of the soil. Most of the native plants need sunlight to germinate. And if you plant those seeds, they won't make it. Okay, that's all the questions we have thus far. Okay, onward. Uh, and here's balsam. Um, now, I arranged these plants in alphabetical order, but oh, by the way, balsam might be the best and the most wonderful of all of the self-sowing annuals. Now, if you see the botanical name, Impatiens balsamina, you already know its sister. Impatiens impatiens is the bedding plant that you all know, uh, and it Impatience, impatience does self-sow just a little, but not enough to be significant. While this balsam, a lot of people don't like it because it, I mean, it is a rampant self-sower and it self-sows and grows in both shade and sun. I mean, wow, who else does that? And bloom continuously, um, usually starting like mid-June all the way through, I have them still blooming in October. Um, comes in four different wonderful colors. This you're seeing the magenta and then behind it, there's the coral, there's the lavender, and there's also a very pale pink that is just, all of them are just gorgeous. They grow both in beds and in containers. And uh, the one problem with them is they are an impatience. And so they are susceptible to the impatience wilt. So if you have gotten that fungus in your soil, you'll only be able to grow these guys uh, in containers. So that's balsam. Oh yes, castor beans. And okay, so they're deadly poisonous, but um, your, your pets or your livestock, they're smart enough to know not to eat castor beans. You do have to worry about grandchildren. I do have to put out that warning. And those of you who remember Deborah Green, the doctor who poisoned her doctor husband and also burned down her house and killed, what, two or three of her children. Um, <laughs> anyway, Castor beans is what she, seeds is what she fed her husband. And they're also the source of uh, rhesus, which is a neurotoxin that was used in the Japanese subway murders about 30 years ago. But it is a gorgeous plant. Um, this is called dwarf blue. My mother who lived in Florida sent me the seeds about 30 years ago. In my garden, it's not blue, it's more of a rich burgundy. And it'll, sometimes it grows as high as 15 feet. Um, of course, the frost kills it. Uh, in every tropical island I've ever have visited around the world, there's always castor beans. But it's a wonderful backdrop to 
in my mind, to any garden bed. And then celosia, uh, coxcomb. Now you'll see this in nurseries, the, um, the cauliflower head. It looks like a, a red brain or a red cauliflower, but those usually don't self-sow. If they do self-sow, they've reverted to this. This is called the wheat form, and they have both purple or green leaves. And so when they're coming up in the spring, I yank out all of the green leaf seedlings because I want the purple foliage or the burgundy foliage is just as vivid as the flowers. Uh, there is also a pale yellow, but to me, it's not a pretty yellow. It's kind of a gray yellow. So anytime I see those, I yank them out too. I want all of my self-sowing to be exactly what I want, which is the burgundy heads and the burgundy leaves. Uh, and these are also crazy self-sowers, but they don't come up until it gets really hot, like even close to first week of June. So don't be panicking if you don't see them early. Cleome. Most of you probably know Cleome or Cleome or spider's flower, or I've been told it's also called grandpa's whiskers. Uh, wonderful plant, but a lot of people don't like it because it self-sows so vigorously. However, I have an arrangement with the flea beetles. You know, of course, I can't use insecticides because I am a certified butterfly garden. Uh, and so the flea beetle, beetles run amok. Their favorite plant is cleome. And they eat probably 90% of the seedlings when they come up, leaving just enough in my landscape to look gorgeous. But they're very easy to weed out if you have too many. And if you buy the new fancy sterile hybrids, well, first of all, they're not going to self-seed. Uh, also, they're not nearly as tall and they're not nearly as floriferous. And then you're gonna have to go back to the nursery and buy them again next year. And they really are quite expensive while my self-sown Cleomay are, well, free. Here's the Cosmos, uh, my Cosmos bipinatus, the traditional Cosmos. Mine grow like six and seven feet tall. Um, that is sort of like that humble brag about my soil. I have really wonderful soil because I've been working on it for 40 years. Um, and so what happens is it then lies down. And so that I like, it's then, then it'll be like two feet tall going through the flower bed because it's awfully tall and lanky on its own. A better choice if you like the color palette is the sunny red. Now it's true of flowers, it's true of butterflies, it's true of birds. I don't know who names these things because that is obviously not a red flower, but they are a beautiful orange and they are a rampant self-sower and they only grow um, maybe two feet tall. So very attractive in the garden bed. Okay, yes, I know, Dame's Rocket. Some of you are probably shuddering uh, because it does have a reputation of being highly invasive. And I'm sure that's true in some situations. Um, but for me, it is not invasive. I mean, to the point where if I want it in a different bed in my garden, I have to actually pick a ripe seed stalk and take it over and lay it down in the area where I want it. It does not spread at all in the garden, much less out in my prairies or my woodlots. But I do caution you, if you see it growing, like there's a whole huge crop of it growing along I-35 just, just north of 135th. And so obviously it's being invasive there. I don't know what the situation is there different, but this is a wonderful flower because it's blooming in April and May and even into June. And you know what we suffer with our gardens is we have these glorious spring gardens with the bulbs and the peonies. And then there's this lag before our summer flowers start to bloom. And so Dame's Rocket is one of those flowers that spans that gap. It's also very popular with the pollinators. So this is one I, I would have to find a way to manage it if it were invasive. And speaking of invasive, um, Larkspur. And this is a fairly new plant for me. I've only had it in my garden since 2015 when one of our master gardeners gave me seeds. And so now five years, it's working its way into being in every single one of my beds. And of course, I am very happy about that because I don't want to plant. You see here, it has decided to join the poppies in my poppy field. Again, you can manage this. There's, uh, there's blue, there's pink, there's white. Whenever white Whenever a plant blooms white, I yank it out and lay it down as mulch. I only want the pink and the blue. 
Um, occasionally, I do have the lavender, like you see, that I will leave also. But it's another one that really, really spreads, which, of course, to me, that's a very good thing. Marigolds. Well, most of the marigolds you see in the nursery are sterile hybrids. The French mar marigolds, the little guys, uh, they are tetraploids, will never self-seed, have no pollen, no nectar. I mean, to me, you might as well go to Hobby Lobby and buy plastic flowers as put these in. But the other marigolds, like the African marigold, the uh, Tajidis erecta, I've tried them. I see no pollinator activity and I've never had them self-seed. Um, pollinators do like the lemon marigolds, but I've never had them self-seed. So you, I know some of you really dislike Latin names. Um, and so you don't have to say them. You just write it on a piece of paper, but you need to be sure specifically that you're getting the species Tajidis patula. Uh, it comes in a couple different colors, the yellow, um, there's sort of a bronze, there's an orange, there's a gold. I have selected yellow, and so I pull out any that bloom in a different color. But these truly do bloom from June all the way to the hard frost in November, and pollinators adore them. Melampodium. I guess there's a common name for it, but I've just always known them as melampodium. This one you will find in nurseries, in flats. And once you've started them in your garden, wherever you want them, year after year, they will self-seed, but not obnoxiously. They're, um, they're not one like the celosia or the balsam that's going to be everywhere. And again, they're a real favorite with the pollinators, but they stay as a nice low bush covered with these very cheerful yellow flowers. And here's the nigella again. And incidentally, those of you who like string cheese, if you buy that in the cheese department and there's these little black seeds in it, those are actually nigella seeds. And nigella seeds are used as a substitute for poppy seeds in a lot of European cooking. Um, again, rampant self-seeder and blooming in May when there's not a whole lot of stuff, the, the bulbs are finishing, the peonies are perhaps getting ready to bloom. This is another one of those season bridging plants and really gorgeous. Ah, Micaciana, flowering tobacco. Now I'm not talking about those little wimpy hybrids that are that you can buy at nurseries. The white one there, that is uh, Micaciana sylvestris, grows to six feet easily. And the new flowers open in the evening and it sends out this fragrance that's like gardenias and jasmine and everything else good. And what they're doing is calling in the moths because they are pollinated by moths. Uh, nobody else has a tongue long enough to reach down to the base where the nectar is. But their common name is only the lonely. Isn't that wonderful? You know, I'm usually such a snob about names, but I love that name, only the lonely. And then the little, the smaller, the Nicotiana elata, it grows to like three or four feet, a wonderful array of different colors of flowers. There's even another species that's green flowered, but I'm sorry. Green is for leaves. Flowers need to be colors other than green. Um, but it also has a wonderful fragrance. Uh, occasionally I've taken them into my basement and incidentally, the uh, Nicotiana alata is a perennial in my garden. Even though it's sold as an annual, listed as an annual, it, it survives the winter in my garden, comes up from the roots. And so I occasionally have taken them into my greenhouse. And when they bloom, the entire greenhouse is, has the fragrance of the Nicotiana. Just wonderful plants. Okay, here's another one that a lot of people hate. Um, you know, if you try to think who is the champion self-seeder, certainly balsam is on that list. Uh, Perella though, might be number one. Uh, this beautiful purple foliage. It also does come in a green form, which if anybody turns up green in my garden, I rip it out because I want the purple. It does send up flower stalks in September with beautiful pale pink flowers that the pollinators love. So if you want to control the self-seeding, just don't let it go to, to bloom. Just cut the flower stalks off. And if they haven't yet bloomed, you can even lay them down as mulch in the garden. Uh, this is also a culinary plant. It's called shizo. It's used in Chinese and Thai cooking and stir fry. To me, the flavor is too bitter to be pleasant, but it has a wonderful aroma of the leaves. I love crushing up the leaves and, and stuffing them in my face for the wonderful smell. 
Oh, my poppies. Now I do have oriental poppies, you know, the large ones, they bloom in April and I love them and I'm glad to have them, but they only bloom for maybe 10 days. My annual poppies bloom for, let's see, they start in April all the way through, sometimes even into July. Um, I've, over the years, I've sown a number of different species. I don't even know who these are anymore because they've probably done a lot of hybridizing among themselves, which is fine. Now, if we were in person, at least one of you would have already asked, how do you get poppy seeds to come to life and flower? And I, for years, did not know. And one of our other master gardeners shared the secret with me, and I'm going to share it with you. The way you get poppies to grow is to sow the seeds on snow. So this is the right time of year. I have all of my packets of poppy seeds that I have ordered. And as soon as we get a nice snowfall that completely covers the flower beds where I want them, I'm going to put them in new beds because the ones I already have are coming up self-sown every year. But in some new beds, I'm going to be throwing, and you can spread them very thinly because almost every seed is going to germinate. And you will have beds of beautiful poppies that if you follow my horticultural uh, methods that I'm going to show you, will come back year after year from seed. Um, this is the Victoria Salvia. It's sold as an annual. It is a perennial in my garden, um, but it also self-seeds like crazy. And in fact, a, a lot of perennials self-seed and I welcome all of that activity. But this is a wonderful plant. It truly does bloom from May to November, and it is a true blue. There's not many plants who have that true blue. And being a salvia, you know who else loves it besides Lenora, and that would be pollinators. Here's the verbena on a stick, uh, verbena bonariensis. Bonariensis means from Brazil. Uh, it is sold as an annual, but it is a perennial in my garden. And uh, I just let it self-sow everywhere. I've had it in my garden now for maybe 10 years, and like the larkspur, it is busy making itself at home in all of my beds and all of my containers, and I am just fine with that. Vine petunias. This is the original petunia, intensely fragrant, um, and each plant will grow like three or four arms that are three to four feet long. Um, the plants themselves choose which color they're going to be. They may be white, pink, all the way to a dark purple. And all of the plants, because they've self-sown, you've got lots of plants. They're all these different, beautiful, harmonious colors. And so they just make this wonderful, fragrant carpet of petunias. And uh, they are a favorite of the hummingbird moth. There's my hummingbird moth with its 10 inch long tongue. So it has absolutely no problem reaching into the nectar of the petunia. Likewise, those Nicotianas that you saw. Um, and if you don't know, who is the child, the caterpillar of the hummingbird moth that is the tomato and tobacco hornworm. Yes, you should never murder those beautiful children because they will turn into a hummingbird moth. Um, let's see, who next? Zinnias, of course zinnias. Um, even though I do have some pom-poms because I planted some at one time and they're busily self-sowing, uh, I really do prefer the uh, flat, single or double, but not pom-pom zinnias. And they are especially favored by the large butterflies. Because if you can imagine being a butterfly in Kansas with all of that wind, and there you are trying to land and balance those huge win wings in the wind. So zinnias are one of their favorites because they can land on it, plant their feet. And of course they taste the flower with their feet and then balance with their wings as the wind blows. Um, I do get fair amount of self-sowing, not as much as I would like. So I this is one that I hand sow seeds in uh, late May. Here is, I've mentioned a number of times, because this is, again, one of my very favorite flowers, the Zinnia angustifolia. And gustifolia means thin leaf. So it's also called the thin leaf Zinnia or the Mexican Zinnia. It never grows much taller than a foot. It sprawls, so it's wonderful for the edge of a border. And it comes in three colors, as you see, orange, yellow, and white. It never gets mildew like the other Zinnias. And again, it truly does bloom from June through to November. 
Um, this is a plant I love so much, and yes, it sells seeds, but never enough for my taste. So I always, every spring, also buy one flat of each of the three colors. And incidentally, um, I buy all of my bedding plants that I have to buy uh, from Flower Farm in Gardner. I email them my order in September because I have a very planned garden. And then in May, we arrange what day I'll come and pick them up. They have the flats all waiting for me outside the greenhouse because you see, I do have plant lust. And so the only way I control that is by not going into nurseries. I don't go into bakeries, I don't go into chocolate stores, and I don't go into nurseries because I cannot control myself. But this is a plant that, yes, I buy them as well as count on their self-seeing. There is an exception to the hybrid rule of the, in, the offspring do not come true to form. And geneticists would say that the genome of the profusion zinnias has stabilized they do produce seeds, they do have pollen and nectar, so of course pollinators love them, and they do come true to seed. They are a hybrid of two plants you already know, the regular zinnia, the zinnia elegans, and then the Mexican zinnia, the zinnia angustifolia. And now I can really only speak self-sowing with orange and with the rose or cherry profusions, because those are the only ones I have in my garden, but they definitely do self-seed. And they come up in wonderful places that I wouldn't have had the imagination to put them. I have yet to find anyone else who has uh, the spider zinnia, zinnia tenuifolia. And I found the seeds in a catalog. I'm gonna be telling you about that catalog in a moment. Um, these flowers are about the size of a quarter, so they're not huge, but the stems are 18 to 24 inches long, very thin, like thin wires, and they sprawl and they're covered with flowers. And so you have this beautiful red-orange flower weaving its way in amongst the rest of the flowers in your beds. And, and for me, all along my path also. Um, it is a zinnia that you can really count on, the zinnia elegans and the zinnia angustifolia. They kind of self-sow. This one absolutely will come back, but it doesn't seem to spread beyond the beds where I've put it. So I have to myself take seeds over to new beds if I want to expand its arena. So we've reached another point where, Lynn, if you have accumulated some questions. Yes, we have a whole bunch. Uh-oh, <laughs> that means I'm not scroll. explaining things clearly. <laughs> I need to scroll back up. Do you find the SSAs creep out of their original locations? I'm sorry, do, you, do I find what? Do you find the uh, self-sowing annuals creep out of their original locations? Oh, absolutely. That's one of the reasons I love them. I never know where they're going to turn up. This is a good thing. But when we get to horticulture, we are going to talk about how to control these little devils. Yes. No, but I want them to spread everywhere because mother nature and where she puts and nurtures seeds far more imaginative than I am. Okay, the next question. Baker Creek has a peppermint balsam. Would it reseed? I don't know because I've never grown that plant. Okay. It isn't one that naturally occurs from the seeds. It took, maybe they found and selected it as a variation of the species, or maybe it's a hybrid, I don't know. Okay, our next question. Is there something I can do to prevent impatience wilt from developing? We love our impatience every summer and would be sad if this developed. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm with that person. I absolutely adore impatiens and used to have beds of them and then my soil became contaminated with the mildew, with the wilt. Um, what you can do is grow them in containers. So uh, if you have become infected, you know, it's a wind-borne fungus and at this point there's not really a prevention or control. Okay, our next question, Cleome or are floriferous, you said. Please define floriferous. Oh, floriferous, lots of flowers. 
<laughs> Back when uh, Dr. Johnson was doing our basic training, he had the word floriferousness. And he said that's what every gardener uh, aspired to was floriferousness. In other words, plants that have as many flowers as possible. Our next question, what nurseries do you recommend to find these varieties in the Kansas City area? Um, can we wait for my second to last slide? I figured that would be the answer. Uh, sure. well, <laughs> yeah, although we'll let, let, let me just, I can back up and do a quick answer. No nurseries. Nurseries do not <laughs> usually sell the self-sowing annuals. So you what gotta go. The, what is the names of the types of marigolds you recommend? You said we don't have to say the name, just write it down. Can you spell it for us? Oh, it was on the slide and it's also on the handout. It's Tagetes is the species for all marigolds and then Patula, P-A-T-U-L-A. And so just when you're buying, just be sure. Well, first of all, I would never buy any plant ever, plant or seed, that the botanical name wasn't with it. Otherwise, you do not know what you are getting. Um, and so you just compare, look at the seed, at the seed package, or on the internet, does it say Tajidis Petula? And then you know you've got the right one. Yes, and I would say it's a wonderful handout with all the Latin names and common names, so it'll come in handy afterwards. I would like to make a comment. This is Lynn, and I am the horticulture agent. Following this presentation, I will be emailing everyone on this uh, Zoom the handouts, which you don't have yet, so if in the participant box, we only have first names or phone numbers, you need to change your name so we know who you are, so we can send you the follow-up email. Thanks, Lynn. Um, Thanks, Lynn. I'm going to the next question. Tell us about your soil. Your beds look so full, uh, so your soil must be perfect. How do you maintain the soil? Um, that's about four slides in from, from here. We're going okay. to talk about soil. All right. Do the vine petunias climb? Not really. They're, they're a member of the tomato family, and so they act like, just like your tomato vines, and that if you want them to actually climb, you got to help them. And I they think prefer to just lay along the ground. Okay. Our next question, I think, will be answered later. Uh, where do you buy your seeds again? That's, I have a whole slide. <laughs> That's coming. Okay. And uh, I forgot to mention, please direct questions to Lynn Wild in the chat. That will help. Um, and someone also says, Lenora is a delightful speaker. Oh, how sweet. Thank you. I'm so, better in person because I dance while I talk. <laughs> Right. Okay, I think those are all the questions thus far. Okay, here we go. We need to talk about horticulture. So I'm going to break some hearts here. If you have a shady garden, the only self-seeder I know that functions in the shade is the balsam. All of these other self-seeders need the sun. It takes a lot of energy for these annual flowers to produce the flowers in great masses. And then you do need, someone's already noticed that and mentioned it, really good fertile soil. We're gonna talk about that in just a few moments. Um, one of the big control measures is mulching. And we're gonna talk, I am the queen of mulching. And uh, we will, we have, Another couple of slides for that. They do also need to be kept watered. Um, I'm thinking back, none of these are really drought tolerant. Some of the native annuals are more drought tolerant. Uh, I showed a slide of some of them, but the ones we're focusing right now on the ornamental flowers, they all need to have sufficient rain. Uh, and so I have, I have hoses. I use hoses the old fashioned way and, and drag them around the garden and keep my garden watered. And most of these plants also like it hot. So many of them do not germinate until like mid-May. Um, or if you are planting seeds, you might want to hold back until middle of May, even first of June before, they plant, before you plant them. Because if it's too cold, 
and wet, they will rot. So this is, this is words from somebody who's learned by tough experience. Obviously, no insecticides, period. Um, all of these insects in your gardens, the pollinators, they were personally invited by the flowers. And for you to murder those insects, well, first of all, you then won't have seeds because you won't have pollination, um, but it really interrupts the natural course of how plants and insects interact. So no insecticides. Okay, um, people are always asking me, when do you plant these self-sowing seeds, in the spring or the fall? Well, and so, if you're in my garden and I'm giving you seed heads, which I do very freely, in fact, I even suggest to people that they bring little baggies with them, uh, because anything that has ripe seeds, I am very happy to share. Well, and so when does Mother Nature sow the seeds? She sows them when the flower has ripened into seeds. Usually that's going to be from mid to late summer through the fall. That's when you plant. You don't keep those seeds over the winter. And you also don't dig holes to plant them. I mean, again, Mother Nature does not dig holes to plant the seeds. She just throws them out there. And, you know, those of you who know me, I am this little teeny 77-year-old woman. And by myself, I take care of a two-acre English estate garden. How is this possible? It's because I work with Mother Nature. All of my processes that I'm going to be showing you um, is how Mother Nature manages her garden, and she's been managing uh, annual flowers for about 100 million years, so I think she has it figured out. And so she's going to throw the seeds out on top of the ground in the fall. That is what I am going to do, and it's what I suggest to people. Now, on the other hand, if you're just starting, um, you're going to be needing to buy the seeds. And so again, it's pretty good timing. Like now it's winter. So you're going through all of the catalogs and you're finding the seeds that you want and you're ordering them. And then in spring, when it warms up, you know, you already know that you want to wait until the soil is 65 degrees before you start planting things like tomatoes. Again, for these self-sowing annuals, if they have a tropical origin, you want to wait until the soil has warmed up and then you can plant them. I don't keep in my head the directions for how to plant seeds. Well, first of all, I hate planting seeds. You know, when I said I hate planting, I didn't mean just plants, it's seeds too. I love digging holes, but I just hate putting plants or seeds in a hole. So I really do rely on the seed packet and the producers of these seeds, they want you to succeed. And so they have excellent directions. And incidentally, uh, Helanthus anus is our state of Kansas state flower, and it is a self-sowing annual. Self-sows like crazy. Um, to me, the plant is too coarse to include in my ornamental garden, but I have it in my prairie garden and also in my, what I call my prairie reimagined, which is where I'm attempting to recreate the look of a native prairie. And so definitely this plant is out there. If you are going to go to the internet to get directions for planting seeds, um, first of all, I suggest you go to sites that end in .edu rather than a commercial site. You may not always be able to find the information on a .edu. Um, so always read at least two or three different sources about the seeds and how they recommend that you plant them before you make your decision of how you will treat that seed in your own garden. So here we go. The first time you are planting the seeds, assuming that you bought them, or perhaps you were foolish and you saved some seeds that somebody gave you from last fall. So you're ready now to plant them. And so first of all, clear away the mulch. And of course, wood chips should never, never, never be used as mulch in a flower bed. No flowering plant evolved with wood chips as its mulch. The mulch should be, um, well, the best mulch, of course, is last year's dead body. I mean, it's all of the debris from last year piled up and forming mulch in your garden. But you clear away and get down to the soil the first time you're going to plant the seeds. And don't be digging and don't be tilling. I could spend at least another hour talking about all the reasons you should never, ever, ever till 
your soil. Now, I know this falls on deaf ears, especially you men who love your boy toys and you want to get out that big stinky monster and destroy your soil, but you should never till. And especially when you're planting new seeds, because when you till or dig, what you are doing is exposing weed seeds. Most weed seeds need the sunlight to germinate and you've just brought them up to the surface and they're like, oh, thank you, Lenora, let me start growing and overrun your, the new plants that you wanted to grow. You want to, because you don't yet know what this, this seedling looks like when it's a baby, you want to plant in a defined pattern. No, no random just throwing them out. Uh, well, for one thing, they're so expensive and it's the thing to look at, how many seeds am I getting for my five dollars? Um, but you want to have them in a defined shape, either in a row or an S-curve or a rectangle, a defined space so that when a predominance of the seedlings that come up in that space, you can be pretty sure that those are the ones you planted and not some random weeds. Unless the seed packet has said, plant a quarter inch thick for in, uh, deep, for instance. Just put them on the surface that you've slightly roughened and tap them down with your hand and then label. Be, don't trust your memory. Gosh, this is again words from somebody who's experienced. I always thought I had such a good memory and I have learned not to trust myself. Always label what, what and where you have planted. As they start to germinate, you may need to water here in Kansas. We can't trust mother nature for moisture. So you may need to water. And after they germinate, you want to thin them and then mulch them. And the mulching will keep additional unwanted seeds, both your plant and the weeds from coming up. Um, if the directions haven't said, must have sunlight to germinate. Uh, in what I do is after I've planted them and I don't bury them in the soil at all, but I put a very, 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 very light coating of mulch over it. I mean, so light that you still see mostly soil, but just enough mulch that helps hold in the moisture. But if the seed packet directions or my investigations on the internet says must have sun to germinate, I do not do that, that little coating of mulch. So you want to learn to recognize your seedlings. A lot of people tell me that they take photographs the first year of what the seedlings look like when they're coming up. You also want to know what the villains look like. And so this is henbit. It's a winter annual. It comes up in September, overwinters as a little green plant. So they're out there. You could be weeding them out now if you wanted to. Uh, and then in April, it bursts into bloom. And even I have to admit, this is pretty darn glorious. It, fortunately, it's in a neighbor's field. I would not feel so good about it if it were in my field. Um, I allow henbit in wild areas on my property, but never in my garden beds, because as you see, each plant produces over 2,000 seeds. I mean, it's a really rampant self-sowing annual itself. Um, but it is a very valuable early, early flowering nectar source for bees. And you yourself, you could pick one of the little flowers and nip off the back end and taste. And you can actually taste the sweet nectar. It is that rich in nectar that you, a human, can taste it. I do a lot of uh, pinching as I wait until they've got at least uh, two true leaves. So they've got their cotyledons, a little seed leaves and then at least two healthy big leaves growing and then I pitch, pinch out the middle and that accomplishes a couple of things. First of all, I have mostly species and so they haven't been bred to be um, bushy. They tend to be kind of lanky and so pinching them it makes them more bushy and it also doubles the amount of leaves and doubles the amount of flowers and some of the more lanky self-sowing annuals I highly recommend uh, doing the pinching. Now, containers, um, I'd say probably at least half of my containers, I don't plant myself. I let them go ahead and self seed and it's because I just haven't gotten to them because you know, spring's a really busy time. And so for instance, the planter you see dead, um, that is profusion zinnias and the Mexican zinnias. And instead of cleaning that up and hauling all of that debris off to somewhere, I just crumple it up with my hands and lay it on top of the potting soil um, and just leave it. 
And usually about mid-May, I'll see the little seedlings coming up. And um, by June, mid-June, they're going to be blooming and I didn't have to do anything. So you see there an example of profusion zinnias, Mexican zinnias, and vine petunias all came up by themselves in that purple pot. Now, I don't represent the no-sow garden as a low maintenance garden, although the idea of low maintenance is really foreign to me. I don't understand why any gardener, and you know, we are all gardeners, why you would want a low maintenance garden. I mean, don't you want to be in your garden messing with it? I love weeding and I love grooming and trimming and pruning and petting them and touching them. And so I want to be in the garden. So to me, weeding is not a bad thing. And of course, these self, somebody asked the question, how do you control them? Well, weeding. You know, people see my garden and truly there are no weeds. Um, if you see a weed in my garden, I will have an, a total emotional breakdown right there in front of you uh, because I do the heavy mulching and I patrol my garden constantly because I love it, not because it's work. And if I see a weed, well, it's kind of like you, you ladies should relate to this. Like you see um, a hair off to the side of your eyebrow, a weed hair, and you grab your tweezers and you grab that hair and you pull it out and it's such a good feeling. So when you have very few weeds, and of course they've had to grow through the mulch so they are really easy to pull. You just grab that sucker and pull. It is such a good feeling. And then because I'm on top of it and none of them have a chance to even flower, much less go to seed, I just throw that weed right down on the ground underneath the plants and let it become part of the mulch. Um, these incidentally are larkspur. The larkspur are what we call winter annuals. They germinate in the fall. They live through the winter as pretty green little plants like this, but uh, like a nice February day, I will be very happily on my hands and knees pulling all of these out. They pull out easily and then I throw them into the beds on either side. They become part of the mulch. By certainly by end of June, and I, you know, you're my friend, so I'll be honest. I talked about thinning your self-sown seedlings. Um, many times I don't get around to it. And so what I have are these really dense mats of self-sown annuals that no weed is going to be able to cut, get through because there's no sun for them to germinate. And because they're competing with each other for nutrients and water, they also stay shorter. So that's a good thing. So again, you use your plants and mother nature to do a lot of the work for you. So here you are. This is what the garden looks like in let's say February. And instead of cleaning all of this up, well, first of all, my garden is not dirty, so I never clean it up. What I do is I shred and every plant that has been growing in my garden, I shred it up and many times mother nature has already done that for me by February, you know, the cold weather, the rain, the snow, it's already broken it up. There's still some big pieces. I just break them up with my hands, lay them down. They become first the mulch and that degrades to compost and then to soil with all of the little microorganisms who are actually who feed your plants by themselves. Plants do not do very well. Uh, most plants need the bacteria and the friendly fungus to feed them. Uh, and so the best fertilizer, the best mulch, which becomes the best fertilizer, is last year's dead bodies. Do not use chemical fertilizers. Again, I could spend an hour ra raving on and on about this. Um, so people think that fertilizer is magic um, and that it's plant food. It's not. Plants make their own food through photosynthesis. Fertilizers are more like vitamins and they are metals like nitrogen and calcium and manganese. These are all metals. And when they're wet, they become salts. And so when you're using synthetic fertilizers, what you do are doing is pouring salt on your soil. Well, most of it washes away and contaminates, but the really serious thing that happens is if you pour synthetic fertilizers on your soil, on your plants, it shuts down the natural nitrogen cycling and the natural production of volatiles, which are the chemicals plants make to repel insects. And so then you end up going and getting more chemicals 
because you've destroyed the natural system and you have to use more chemicals as more fertilizer and more insecticides. If you use last year's dead body as the mulch and the fertilizer, you will not need synthetic fertilizers or insecticides. So we're at another point. I've said a lot of things that are going to be um, al almost a heretic to some of you because, but truly the new horticulture now is promoting no tilling and the use of mulch and natural organic fertilizers. So uh, I used to feel like I was this lone prophet out in the wilderness, but now all the gardening magazines and internet that I'm reading are saying the same thing, promoting no tilling and promoting using a heavy mulch that becomes the food for your plants. So enough proselytizing. Lynn, do you have some questions? Yes, the first one, what do you mulch with? Um, well, that's coming up in about two slides. Okay, define deadheading. You said stop deadheading in September. Yes, um, deadheading is cutting off the flower that has died uh, before it goes to seed. And so I want the seeds you know, I want to deadhead my annuals up to September because that promotes more and more flowers. But by September, I want them to go to seed. So they're seeding for next year. And so that's why I stopped deadheading. As I deadhead, as I mentioned before, all of those dead flowers, they I throw them right under the plant and they become mulch. What are your favorite self-seeding annuals for containers? Any that work particularly well together? Yes. Um, well, I showed the slide that had the profusion zinnias, the Mexican zinnias, and the vine petunia. That's a really nice combination. I also have a slide, might be still to come, that has celosia, also the balsam. All of those work really well in the containers. And uh, the verbena bonariensis, the verbena on a stick, it self sows into all my containers, and I leave it. I love it. Our next question, can I use some aged manure with my compost? I have lots. Yes, absolutely. The thing about it though, is if you pile the manure on, then you're blocking the growth of self-sowing annuals. So um, it's one of those things where you have to kind of balance how much you're putting on of material that's not the plant material. But if your soil needs that nutrition, definitely do it. See, I don't do any hauling of things away to a compost pile. To me, that seems really foolish, you know, to gather up all of the dead stuff, drag it off to a compost pile, and then a year later, because, you know, I'm too busy to turn it, so I have to wait a year, go back, gather up that compost, and drag it back to my garden. No, I compost in place. That's really what I'm doing when, for instance, you see all these balsam, and there's some coleus and, and celosia. None of those are going to leave that spot in the winter. They are all going to remain there as their little dead bodies becoming mulch, becoming compost. Okay, that's all the questions we have so far. Okay, ready to go again, going deeper. So of course, as I'm talking about self-sowing flowers and letting plants choose where they're gonna be, it's just natural to think, well, my garden is going to be a hot mess. Um, and if you like a really, really groomed formal garden, again, this is not going to work for you. I mean, it's, this is not your aesthetic and that's okay. But if you like it a little wild, a little loose, if you celebrate serendipity, um, self-sowing annuals absolutely works. But there are some control measures. And the first one is to have a very strong design of your garden. It's not happening by chance. You actually have a piece of paper and you have drawn out your garden beds and your garden paths. It doesn't have to be graph paper. You don't have to measure. You just want to have laid out um, the overall look of your garden. And then you use hardscaping to make those lines that you've designed permanent, you know, to make the beds, to make the paths, to have them lined out. And then of course, deadheading, um, if you don't want to have that flower come back in that place. You just keep deadheading through the fall and do not throw those seeds underneath the plant. Instead, we'll 
you know, I'm in Miami County, so I can burn. I throw things I don't want in the garden into the burn barrel. Um, you wouldn't want to put them in the compost pile because those seeds are likely to survive and repopulate other beds when you move that compost. And then you will have to weed. You know, I mentioned that when you see my garden, um, there really are no weeds. And I've been gardening now on Long Lips Farm for about 40 years. And I have discovered the secret of a weed-free garden. Yes, you're my friends. So I'm going to share it with you. The secret to a weed-free garden is I weed. I am patrolling the garden and weeding every day, which means it's only the occasional grab that weed and yank it out. Um, it's not an, an onerous task, which it becomes if you let things get out of hand. The other thing that makes weeding really, really easy is the heavy mulching, because then the soil underneath the mulch is, is still going to be moist, and it's just very easy to yank that weed out. So um, as an example, you know, this view of my garden, the grass in the back is our native switchgrass, uh, the Panicum ver vergatum, and it is uh, perennial grass. It's what they should be using instead of corn, because it is a perennial that needs no fertilizer and is drought resistant, not even just tolerant. Um, I've had my um, panicum in my garden for 30 years. They have never self-sown. Um, so that's a good thing because I don't want them to. The pale yellow flowers are our native uh, evening primrose, the Anothera biennis. And the, of course, you've already met my balsam and my perella. They both chose this spot. I did not put them there. But you see every photograph that shows a view of the landscape, not just an individual flower. You will always see an edge. That is your control, so it does not look like a hot mess. So it is under control. And if you keep that edge absolutely clean, if you have only a few minutes every week, clean the edge and your garden will look neat and manicured, even if it's a hot, holy mess back behind that edge. Let's see, what do we have next? Here's just a drawing, just to give you an idea of how loose your drawing of your garden could be. This is another one of the slides we could easily spend an hour on. Um, in fact, if you go to horticultural school, you're gonna spend a year on landscape design. But uh, basically what we're saying is that gardens are not about plants. They really aren't. My mother was a landscape designer. And so part of my very early and very severe toilet training, she taught me that gardens are not about plants. They are the very last thing you think about. The first thing you think about with your garden is its function. What do you want your garden to do for you? And then what forms and lines will accomplish that purpose? And then what colors do you want? What, are your, what is your aesthetic for colors? And only then do you choose the plants that will fulfill your need for color and the lines and the forms that will fulfill the function. Well, I know I'm, I'm not going to make much impact on a lot of you who are what I call lovingly, lovingly, the ploppers. And your idea of planning your garden is planning what you're going to wear when you go to the nursery and pick the eye candy off the tables to put in your cart. And then you'll find a place for them when you get home. Um, and if that works for you, that is your garden. Um, but again, that early toilet training, I got to have a plan on paper and I actually do not buy any plant unless there is a designated spot for it, a little X on the piece of paper, where it is going to go in my garden. That is the only way to maintain control. So here's a view of, I call it the wall garden because that is a brick wall that I had professionally built. Uh, and you can clearly see the lines of the paths and the lines of the beds. All of my beds are edged in either brick, stones, or in my shade garden uh, with logs because I think that is a more appropriate look. Uh, my paths, I have some that are actually concrete. Again, I had those professionally poured. Uh, and then a lot of gravel paths. And I personally, I did not buy gravel. I know I am a sick, crazy person. I don't like the look of any store-bought gravel I've ever seen. So every time I'm digging 
or wandering and I find a rock, I put it in my pocket and bring it to my path. So these are all hand collected pebbles in my paths. And then in my shade garden, I do use wood chips for the paths, but of course never in amongst the plants. But this gives you an idea of laying out a design. And then throughout the summer, you know, I get busy just like you. I keep those edges clean. And no matter what the plants do, the garden still looks organized. And that's what the human brain wants. Our human brain wants to see organization. It's scared of chaos and wants to see with a garden, especially the first, um, the first element of a garden is intent that it is an intentional design, an intentional plant, and that's how you keep from having a chaotic effect. So mulch. Now, I've been gardening on Longlips Farm for 40 years, and when I bought it, well, when, when we bought it, there was no, not even a house. It was just a pasture, and we had the house moved in from six miles away. So I have pictures of my three-story house on a flatbed truck coming down Highway 68. There was nothing. And so initially, as I started planting, and, and again, the garden was all drawn out. My mother, the landscape designer, came the second summer and spent about a week, and I was so mad. I really was, because I wanted her to just give me a list of plants, you know? Um, but no, she spent about a week wandering around the house and, you know, looking at the sunlight, looking at the moisture, you know, checking the soil. Uh, and then a very thoughtful list of plants was the result based on first, you know, asked me a lot of questions of what I wanted to do with the property and then studying what the sun was like because there was no shade at that point and then coming up with a very thoughtful list of plants. That was the process. And at that point I had to buy mulch and someone asked about what do I use for mulch. So back when I was having to buy mulch, uh, my favorite mulch is rotted alfalfa. You can buy it in small bales, and usually the farmers raise alfalfa specifically for the horse people. I don't know if there's any horse people in the audience, but they buy alfalfa for their horses, and there's usually leftover. And so I, a lot of times they'll just give it to me because it's rotting, and that's the best mulch of all. It's nitrogen rich because it's in the pea family, and occasionally a little alfalfa plant will take root. They have an absolutely gorgeous purple flower, and they're also a host plant for uh, the copper and the uh, hair streak butterflies. So wonderful. Also, I've used straw a, a lot before I had my own mulch. When my trees started to get big enough to have leaves, I would uh, gather and use my John Deere tractor to run over the leaves uh, to grind them up a bit. I don't like the leaf shredders and the uh, shredding machines because they shred the mulch too fine and it forms a crust on the soil. I like it to be in chunks. The mulch should be big enough that you can tell what it was. You know, is that a stem of a plant? Was that a leaf? Compost, it's broken down to look more like soil, but you can still see there's stuff in it. And then fully composted to become soil, all you can see are the mineral content. Um, initially, um, I didn't have enough of my own mulch. My neighbor who had maple trees used to bring up literally truckloads of maple leaves that I would grind up. Now with my oak leaves, I have enough. And so if a leaf falls in a flower bed, I leave it. If a leaf falls in one of my paths, I gather it up and I put it into a flower bed um, that seems to be a little thin on mulch. I am never taking any plant any debris out of the garden because that is my fertilizer and if you remove that material you are actually removing nutrients from the system. Um, but all of your mulch and it usually takes about a year. I've had people complain my mulch goes away and they get all excited upset about it and I'm like no no this is a good thing because what happened to that mulch it didn't evaporate into the air it became compost it became soil minerals that the little microbes could feed your plant. It's a good thing. And there, I know there are long companies who go in and tell people that they have to remove last year's mulch and take it away. And of course they charge you for that and then put new mulch on and it's usually wood chips. All of this is entirely foreign to how mother nature would manage a garden. And it's also a lot more expensive. Um, I do have some succulents and I do leave them unmulched because they they like to be dry, 
That's the only part of my garden I leave unmulched. And there I do have to be a bit more vigilant about weeds. But again, two to three inches of mulch, um, up to four inches in, so, in, in some areas if I don't have herba a lot of flowers, herbaceous flowers growing, uh, that will definitely keep the moisture in and the weeds out. So just so you can see, you know, Real life example. So here's the wall garden. You saw it earlier in May. Um, and here it is in, I just, when it, when winter came and everything's dying, I just let it be. I do not, I hate that word, clean up my garden. I leave everything. And so mother nature chops a lot of it up. But eventually, usually middle of February to middle of March, there'll be a day that's pretty nice. And to me, nice means there's no wind. I don't care about temperature. I can just put on more layers of clothing, but I hate the wind. But I will go out. I'm old and decrepit. So I sit down and hand crumple, crumple all of this debris. It's very easy. You don't need any kind of tools. And, and I hate machines anyway. I want to be in my garden. I want to be touching it. I want to be hand crumpling it up. And so you see, this is about an afternoon's work. Um, and very easy, very leisurely. Just crumple it all up and lay it right back down where it was growing. Lenora, keep, yes. Excuse me. Uh, you have about ten minutes left, uh, just being the timekeeper, and a few more questions oh, thank you. when you're ready for them. I will. I will speed it up, okay. but we are getting towards the end. Thank you. Golly, how time flies when you're having fun. Okay, so one of the ways also to avoid chaos is to plant very deliberately in geometric or ribbon shapes. Um, again, what we're looking for is intentionality. And so here's real life, what the mulch looks like. This is Mexican zinnias. They have died and there they are. Uh, in February, they're still there. And then I crumple them up by hand and then uh, the Mexican zinnias there, I do uh, move the mulch apart and I make a strip, whatever shape I want them to be in. Actually, this goes longer and it becomes a nice curved shape. I like ribbons. And then the seeds are exposed to the sun and they germinate just in this spot. And the mulch keeps any weed seeds or unwanted Mexican zinnias from coming up outside of my shape. Here's the same spot in my garden um, almost 20 years. I need to take a picture this spring. So you can see I didn't plant the first group of plants, the melampodium, the celosia, the cleomae, the marigolds, all of those I planted. But from then on, I have not had to plant. So at one point, the perella and the cleomae really took over. And now it's primarily cleomae and um, that's snow on the mountain, Euphorbia marginata, a, a native annual self-sowing. If I get tired of either of those, all I have to do is gather them up before they go to seed and um, something new can take over or I can plant something else. Same kind of idea. You've seen this garden a couple times. Uh, this is the garden that I started in 2014 with self-sowing annuals. And this is what it looks like in July and then what it looks like in November. You see, my garden is not dirty. There is no reason to clean any of that up. I leave everything. And I think it's, there is a different kind of beauty. The shapes are all still there, the forms, lines, and shapes, but it's a different color palette. And then by, usually by early March, I will have gotten in there on my hands and knees and very happily hand crumbled all of the materials. And from that, I get two or three inches of mulch at least and leave it piled. And some of my self-sowers are so eager, I don't even worry about clearing a space. They will come up even through this mulch in appropriate numbers rather than overrunning the space. So an example of my sunny red cosmos that um, I have along the edge of the bed that you just saw. And I just leave it and then I crumple it. And there's, you see the heavy seedlings. In theory, I I thin them, but that doesn't really, well, it might happen once, but then more come. So eventually what I end up is this really thick, wonderful bed that then when it dies, becomes mulch and then becomes seedlings and then becomes flowers again. It's what we call regenerative gardening. It takes care of itself. And as the dead material first mulch, then compost, then fertile soil, again, it all takes care of itself. Now, if the entire two-acre garden were all self-sowing annuals, that would be pretty boring. 
you would get tired of it. And so what you do want to do in your garden also is have other gardening rooms. I actually have 23 gardening rooms, although that's fairly flexible, but where I have completely different kinds of plants and looks. And so in my shade garden, I have my elephant ear garden with the hostas and the bamboo. I also have roses and crepe myrtle, even though they are of no use to my butterflies, but I like them. So I have that garden. And then this is the wall garden that you've seen a couple times, mostly perennials, but again, leaving all of those and crunching them up for mulch in the fall. So you've asked, and of course you have, where do I get these plants? Well, you would be buying them as seeds. My favorite company is Select Seeds. Um, they sell only heirloom seeds, so you do not have to be worrying about hybrids that won't self-seed. They're the only catalog I've ever seen, both vine petunias and balsam for sale. Seed Savers Exchange also specializes in heirloom seeds. Wonderful people, uh, highly recommend them. If you do go on the internet, you want to check out multiple sources and be sure that you're not buying a hybrid. So our summary. I bet you thought I couldn't finish by one, Lynn. <laughs> so first of all, you do need to start with a strong design. Your garden should be on paper first and then use mulch to control the weeds and control the spread of those self-sowing annuals. You will have pollinators galore. They will love you and thank you. And you will have this kind of color from April to November with very minimal work. So we're ready for questions. Okay, uh, two questions. Leaf mulch. Someone told me recently not to use oak leaves because it was something in it that is hard on plants. How do you feel about oak leaves and flower beds? Well, all I have are pin oaks. <laughs> and so how I feel about, obviously, that's th those are the leaves that are in my beds. They do take longer to break down. And so those are leaves that um, hand crushing, and I used to use my tractor and actually crush them up a little bit, that would be better. By spring, they usually have degraded just enough that with my hands, I can break them up a bit. They do have tannin in them, and that's probably the chemical the questioner is asking about, but that tannin quickly degrades and is not a problem. Okay, and do you cut back your castor bean plants? Mine gets so big and heavy, I have to stake them. Well, I don't stake mine. They just grow straight up to 12 to 15 feet tall. And I leave them over the winter. And I, I could, you know, I could turn the camera around and show you out in my yard. I've got these 15 foot stems out there. Uh, but I will be able to cut them um, with a saw. They cut, they have very, very soft wood. So it's very easy. I just saw them off at ground level. And I leave that root in the ground because within two years, it will have degraded and become more mulch. Okay. And what grasses do you use for structure? Which are planted annually and which are perennials? Oh, and I, I love grasses. So I have the, the native um, switchgrass, highly recommend. The variant that I have is called heavy metal, and that may be why it doesn't self-sow, because it is a, a variant. It's not the species, straight species. And then I also have a lot of uh, miscanthus, I'm trying to think what the common name for that is. It'll, it'll probably come to me. Anyway, a lot of miscanthus, which is an ornamental grass, which is winter hardy, like the panicum. Um, what else do I have? Um, the penicetums are the ones that are bright red or my vertigo brilliant black purple. Those are not winter hardy. And so those I do plant as much as I hate planting. They are so beautiful. They are totally in the, I must have them in my garden, and so I do plant those every year. I also dig some up because they will overwinter in my greenhouse. And I would say if anyone has further questions, Lenora's uh, email is listed there, lenora.longlips at gmail.com. And so that concludes our program. Uh, I would encourage you to consider Oh, and I just wanted to say thank you, Lenora, for the excellent Oh, thank you. Uh, there have been many positive comments. I encourage you to consider attending our upcoming Zoom presentation on planting natives in Northeast Kansas by Sharon Ashworth on Thursday, February 4th. And as has been mentioned earlier, 
please remember to look for the email after class with the today's handouts and three questions to answer. Uh, we value your input. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome.